you know, I do this each year, but uh, we'll do it again. If uh, you uh, are a great grandmother, raise your hand. If you're a grandmother, raise your hand. If you're a mother, raise your hand. And if you had a mother, raise your hand. Yes, we all celebrate Mother's Day. It can be a, a, a difficult day, but it also can be a, a joyous day, a day of gratitude. And we're glad that you're here on, to worship on this special day. Let's uh, now begin by singing together, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the Eyes of My Heart. Let's sing together.
immortal, invisible God, only wise. Christ came into the world to save sinners. He took our sins upon his body on the cross that we might be free of the sins that bind us. My friends, in this confidence, remember that in Christ we are forgiven. Let us stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Thank you. 
17, verses 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in front of Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations in, to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he, did, he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since our God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man who he has, who he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And from John, the 14th chapter, part of Jesus' lesson in the upper room before he parts uh, to Gethsemane and arrest and the cross. Jesus tells them in the closed room, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you, and in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. I will love them and reveal myself to them. We thank God for these words.
I hope you saw some of my family pictures at the Aragopolis. It is one of my favorite places in all the world. In fact, before those pictures, the family had not necessarily wanted to go to the Aragopolis because they'd been before, and I had a tantrum that we had to go to the Aragopolis. It is a wonder that sunset. To climb on top of it and sit with others looking out over the sprawling city of Athens with the mountains in the background as the sun sinks behind the hills. Yes, being on the Aragopolis is one of my favorite places in all the world, but that's not where Paul spoke. We like to go there. The church like to crawl upon it. That is where the sign says the Aeronopolis. The last time we were there, it is so worn by people walking upon it that the marble stone had become so slick that I fell the last time I was at the Aeronopolis. But on top of it is not where Paul spoke to the Athenians. No. As you come from the Acropolis with the Parthenon down the Propoplea, which are the stairways leading up, you come down, and as you come down, there on the right is a marker from where I showed the picture of the one that is in the museum, the idol to an unknown God. Paul had been on the Acropolis, he had walked down. And he had gone further down. To just the right of the Aragopolis is a path that not many take. Down that path you go to the old Greek Agora, the Greek market, and they then expanded the Roman Forum, the Roman market. That's the path of Paul. Paul had been in the city waiting for his companions, Silas and Timothy, to join him. And when he had arrived in Athens, he did what Paul always did when he arrived in a new community. He found the synagogue. Paul went to the synagogue, and in his touring of the city, he noticed that well, there were so many idols. And at the synagogue, he, they discussed all these idols and the God of Moses and Abraham and Isaac. But Paul did not just stay in the synagogue. As it was his way, he went into the markets. There he talked with people about Jesus. There he shared himself with others and told the story of his mission and of his call. And it's there as he went among the people of the market, which is really his his place, where he was more at home, these Athenian intellectuals wanted to challenge him. The Epicureans and the, the Stoics, particularly the Stoics were, were Neoplatonists. They had built an idea around a, a world that was real, that is unseen, and that we live in the world of, of shadows. And we are to strive to make ourselves real so that we match match the ideals of the creator, the main mover, the one who started all things moving. And these intellectuals, these neoplatonists, these epicureans and stoics decide they want to find out what this Israelite is, is saying. By this time, they had encountered many cults from the east, from from Persia and from Africa, and certainly they knew Judaism, but they had not heard or did not know about this new God that Paul seemed to be representing. They wanted to hear about what was new. It said they wanted new ideas to find out what was going on in the mind and in the world. So they invited him to the paradox. And it was not an intention to lift him up and put him in the teacher's spot. No, it was intended to put him in a 
humiliation, for them to take him apart, to them to prove how irrational his teaching was. But Paul, knowing the challenge, accepted it. And he had his own curveball. Rather than being like Stephen, who we talked about being stoned, his, his preaching and, and pointing to the Old Testament, Unlike Peter, who has he talked to commerce, always brought up how Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise of the prophets. No, Paul in his wisdom inspired by God looks around and uses something that the Athenians knew. Something that they would understand. Something that would connect them. Like any good preacher does. To connect to his so Paul, as he had gone from the Acropolis down to the Agora, had seen a, a small statue. A small statue marked Agnostos Theos. Agnostos Theos. Where we get the word agnostic from? Unknowing. Agnostos Theos. <laughs> an unknown God. There You see, from the market, they would walk up and, and get in front of the Aragonites. We often, in our imagination, appear, uh, uh, I want to see Paul standing on top of it in a position of power, preaching out the, the gospel of Jesus. But that's not how the Aragonites were. You weren't on top of it to speak. You were at the bottom of it. The background of the area was in a bit of a, of a shape, kind of like the uh, 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 the, the L.A. Bowl, the Los Angeles Bowl. It is just uh, like a, a screen, a cup that then the, the show goes on, and it causes the sound to go out and project it to the audience. That's what the area was. was. It was shaped such at the very bottom, there was a little indention where the speaker, when they spoke there, it reflected against the rock and then went out to the people on the edge of the marketplace. It went out to those who left the market to come to hear something new, something wise, something true. It is there at the Aragonthus that Paul starts talking He says, as I've gone through Athens, I see that you are religious people. That you have many, <laughs> many gods in your community. But there's a God that I want to talk to you about today. I saw that you have a God or a statue, an idol to an unknown God. And today, I want to make that God known to you. Paul has connected to their context, to their life. You see, Paul wanted them to know that the God of creation is the God he represented. And so he begins by telling them that the God that he represents cannot be confined in one of these marble buildings, cannot be captured in a marble statue, but the God that he represents is the God of all creation that gives life to all beings. And in that God chose to come among us. And God affirmed this God in our own by raising him from the dead. Quite different than the, the other gods, the Greek gods. The Greek gods each fit into a different category. They were created to, to fit in our understanding of our world in different roles. We know there was Zeus, the the supreme God, there was Poseidon, the God of the sea, Apollo, the God of the, the sun, Aphrodite, the God of, of love, Athena, the God of, of wisdom. Each of the gods fit into a particular role, a particular activity. Just 
control our God doesn't fit into our egos. Our God doesn't fit in all the little categories, all the little boxes we would like for the gods to fit in. Our God is a free and loose and wild, changing and challenging God. Our God does not just work the way we want it to. Our God cannot be manipulated by our ideas. Our God is to challenge us and change us to be more loving, to be more like Jesus. You remember his commandments there in the upper room, that you love one another. He proclaims himself and the Father as one, and he's going to send the advocate to us, and this is all bound together in a package of love. That is the God that Paul wants them to meet at the Aragopolis. Not a God made with human hands, not a God made of silver and gold and stone, but a living God of love. We see that Paul is partially affected. Those at the Curious and Stoics who came there to challenge him left unimpressed. But it says that some heard and some began to believe in this living God that couldn't be confined to a marble temple or caught in a, in a sculpted statue. My friends, we live in a time not of marble idols or marble temples, but we are the same humans as the Athenians were. We would like God to fit in our boxes. We would like God to be controlled and in our categories of understanding. We'd like for God to stay in God's place. You know, see, that's the thing about an idol. Once you move a place an idol someplace, it doesn't move. It just sets there. But our God is a living God that is moving in us and through us through this advocate that Jesus promised, through this spirit that lets us know that this God is real and personal and for us. Too often, we don't want to face the individual challenge of our spirit the individual changes that we have to make in order to be more true and to be more kind and to be more loving. And we would rather choose the idols of our world, of wealth, of prestige, of fame, of, of power. It's so easy to tap into the, the idols of our day, our desires. We're a firm by putting ourselves with idols, we're affirmed to claim these ways of power, we're affirmed to pursue wealth and, and privilege. But if we take these things and make them our gods, we are simply worshiping ourselves, worshiping our own desires, worshiping our projections, worshiping our own ego. For in these objects created with human hands, the only thing that lives is us in them. They are dead stone. They are empty ideas. They are our creation. But just like any of our creations, they fade and they break. In the great number 
churches. We read about uh, how even the automobile began this process of us, rather than gathering as family and close church net people, we decided to travel and see the, the, the area. And then has the, the, uh, the, the, the changes in blue laws to everything is what we do. You can do anything you want any other day of the week today. And it's not as much as the world offers it as if we choose we choose to make Sunday rather than a day of contemplation and reflection, simply another day to get things done or Sunday fun day. And it sure is pleasing, isn't it? And that's one reason we can question, are we engaging in idolatry? Are we getting sidetracked by just our own what for recreation and leisure? I know in this I'm preaching to the choir because you were here. But we have to reflect on other aspects of our lives that we want to idolize. That we want to make our priority and even they even put our hope into these things. That if we have them, if we possess them, if we do them, we will be fulfilled. But I think as we look around our world and we see those who are pursuing these we realize that there is no fulfillment, just the chase, the chase that ends with the end, and that is it. But if we follow the words of Paul, if we hear this call, if this God of creation is all around us and has a relationship with each of us, if we will just and if we will listen and if we will engage. And when we engage God, it's not as if God will do just what we want to do. We don't get to manipulate that God. We don't need to dictate to that God. We cannot use that God to fulfill our own egos. For when we come to the living God, that God challenges us with love. Have you loved enough? Have you reached out in love? Have you rejected love? That is the word of a living God. A God not of stone, not of human hands, but a God that lives and moves and in which we have our being to go upon. My friends, Jesus is not a dead stone. We may have the images of Jesus here, but they're not our idols. They're just to reflect us back to the scripture. Jesus is not simply a cold stone Athenian statue. Instead, Jesus is alive. And in the resurrection, God has confirmed that he is the one that we should devote ourselves. One who challenges us and one who will not let us stay right where we are, but calls us to change, to change, to be more faithful, to be more hopeful, and especially to be more loving. It's as we follow Jesus and as we gather in his name to share the truth of his word and of his life, that we are reminded that in the resurrection and in all of creation, in all of these wonders of faith, they are created by God and God alone. And that no matter how much we would want to create this faith, no matter how much we want to, to recreate the, 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 the wealth and the power that some have, we follow a, a, a God 
time where we come together to share our joy and our concerns. Are there any uh, prayer concerns we need to, to lift up today? Our, our joys that we want to celebrate? Okay, let's come together in prayer. Oh, creative, creating God, Lord, we thank you that you don't fit into our boxes and you don't fit into our category, that you are so much more, that you have taken us from the, the dirt, the soil of the earth, and formed us, and in your breath you have given us life and your spirit. Lord, keep us humble, keep us trusting in you, keep us relying on you day by day. That as we lean upon you, you help us to grow in wisdom and understanding of this world and the world to come. Lord, help us to, to lean on you so that in our times of weakness, when our world doesn't fit together, when our ideas are falling apart, that we may lean on you and that you might gather us and hold us and make us anew. Remind us that you are never far from us, that, that you are here, and that you are the one that has created all that we have and all that we know. Yes, indeed, Lord, we are challenged and we struggle in this world, but Lord, we pray that you remind us that we are not alone, that we have one another and we have you in your spirit to guide us forward. Lord, so often we struggle and we lose our vision and we pray, Lord, that your spirit will then point us in the right direction of where we can go to follow you and to serve you as you would have us serve. Lord, it's in our service of others that we come in prayer today. Lord, we pray that you'll watch over Brenda and help her to heal from her, her back injury. Be with us. Uh, Brooks as he cares for her. Be with Kevin and be with Wilma in her cancer battle. Be with Joyce. Be with Tom. Be with uh, Judy. Watch over Betty and Barb. Be with Joy and Georgiana and Lois and Lynn. Watch over Fern. Be with Carol. Be with Sarah and Pamela. Be with Brittany and Lil. Be with Ruth and, and uh, Jake. Be with Lynn and all those that need to know that you are there and that you bring healing and eternal hope. Today, Lord, we are thankful for the gift of, of mothers and those that have the spirit of, of motherhood within them. Lord, we're thankful for those that bring life and then nurture life and celebrate life. Lord, we pray that we will always remember to be humbly dependent on those who've gone before us and who have laid the path for us to, to follow in faith. Lord, we thank you for the gift of mothers in our lives. And now, Lord, we pray that you will guide us away from idolatry, not to worship the things of the making of our own hands, but to fall under and and give ourselves over to those things that are eternal. Of your love and your faithfulness, God, we know that they will last forever. Let us not look to the things that are perished, but let us look to you for our hope, that we may, together with one another and our faithfulness, move into the future that you prepared for us as Forest and Presbyterian, as individuals, and as disciples of Jesus. That we might more and more each day follow in his ways and in his life. And we pray this with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us 
with our move yesterday. Many have been preparing for weeks now for the move, and uh, we're so thankful for everyone that showed up to help us make the move yesterday. Everybody at John Knox who was here to welcome us and show us where to place things. It's been a, a long process, but uh, we're, we're getting there. It's going to take some time now to unpack and settle uh, in, but we're so thankful for all of you who have given your time through weeks and weeks, and there's still more to be done, but uh, thank you all who showed up for our move yesterday. And now, uh, one of the things that you're uh, a bit rushed in because of the move is the third offering in our Presbyterian offerings. This is the Pentecost offering. This is an offering that is directed towards you. 40% of this offering stays with us, and then 60% is divided up among uh, different youth missions uh, of the Presbyterian Church USA uh, for uh, children at risk, young adult, and then the young adult ministry program of the Presbyterian Church. So uh, I hope that uh, as uh, we like this offering on Pentecost, you've been so faithful with the denominational offerings, and they they join us into the mission of the wider church. So I hope you'll uh, participate on the 28th on Pentecost by uh, giving to the Pentecost offering. What do we have next? School supplies. We're continuing school, school supplies. The school supplies barrel is right out as you come in for this month. It's a spiral notebooks. Uh, why are college rule? If you don't want to do shopping yourselves, uh, you can make a donation, and uh, we have others that will, will shop for you. Uh, all, now, uh, the Pentecost service on the 28th, uh, the 28th day of May is Pentecost, and we're having a great celebration here at FBC John Knox. We're going to have a joint service. Now, if you predicted this is important because you need to mark your, your calendar. We're, rather than uh, 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 starting uh, at 1045, we're going to start at 10 o'clock as a joint service. This is kind of an in-between time. We'll gather uh, to worship together to celebrate the gift of the, the Holy Spirit, and uh, then we're going to have a, a meal together. Uh, we uh, are going to have a food truck here, a uh, soul burger, and we're going to have a band here to, to play for us, and it's going to be a real celebration together uh, here in our new nesting church. So we hope that you'll uh, join us for, uh, for worship and a time of fun and celebration at the end of the month on the 28th uh, at 10 o'clock. So join us on Pentecost. Yes, any other announcements? Yes, Ellen. Don't forget to tell the mothers about the flowers you brought out. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ellen. Uh, for Mother's Day, we have some flowers in the back, little roses. Now, uh, break off the stem, uh, and each of you, please, uh, mothers, and everyone, I think, probably can break off and take a little rose with you today for Mother's Day. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, again, uh, thank you for everyone and all those here and online that have generously given and uh, support of our mission and ministry. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Oh, holy God, we thank you for the, the, the giving hearts. Those that, uh, even though we have been ups and downs, have been faithful in their giving, we ask that you bless all our offerings and that we may use them to your glory now and forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and we'll sing this doxology and then sing our last hymn this morning. Let's stand and sing the doxology.